good evening. Thank you for your patience. It's my honor and my privilege to have published this book, Bhima Koregao, Challenging Caste, Brahminism, Brahminism's Wrath Against Dreamers of Equality. May I request, Ajaz, where are you? Yeah. Come, take your seat. He's also going to be our first speaker. Ajaz and I go back a long way to the pioneer. And when he, he's used to be, when I first met him, he was a person, he was a quintessential behind the scenes person. He would be improving other people's writing. He would be giving headlines. He would be asking questions of the writers, clarifications from them. And he more or less continued doing the same thing when he joined, he left the Pioneer, he joined Outlook magazine. And then after Outlook, we saw this amazing new avatar of Ajaz Ashraf. He became a prolific columnist, a writer on most things under the sun, in particular social issues, politics, and sometimes even economics. So, one day we said, why, Ajaz, why don't you compile all the articles that you've written, the columns you've written, into a book? And he said, no, there should be a theme. It should not be like everything under the sun. And so I said, you've been interviewing a lot of people who have been associated with the Bhima Koregao episode, for want of a better phrase. Why don't you compile their testimonies, their their families, their near ones, you've done interviews with lawyers representing them. So this could be a good theme. And he thought over it and he said, yes. He said, then should we also add another theme to it? There's a lot of other things that have been happening. And finally, the book went on to become much more than that. It became much more than the testimonies of people who knew, who were part of what happened, and their near and near ones and their lawyers. It went, uh, it became a uh, looking at what happened in Bhima Koregao through the prism of caste. There's already been a book that has been published on the subject, a very thick book. I understand there's at least one other book that's coming out. But we do believe that, I do believe that this is a unique book because it looks at the violence that took place at Bhima Koregao as a clash between two worldviews and one that strives to flatten the social hierarchy and the other one justifying it and perpetuating it. And it was not I, but Yana, who edited the book, he said it reads like a thriller. So as a publisher, I'm only, only going to say good things about the book. And you should feel free to not just read it, but critique it. And it goes into, I mean, he mixes his qualities as a journalist, as a reporter who's reporting day-to-day -day events with the with the rigor of scholarship. So he's also willy-nilly with this book in particular, become a scholar, even though he may not agree with what I have to say. At one level, it delves very deep into what's happening, the plays, the songs, what happened at the Elgar Parishad, which was crit critiquing not just Brahminism, but Prime Minister Narendra Modi. And he goes beyond it to delve into archival records, and the histories and the many histories and the many ways in which this incident came to be looked at. So I'm not going to speak too much about the book. I'm going to let Ajaz speak about the book. May I invite the panelists to come on this? That way they vacate a few seats for those standing. They can come and sit. We are very happy to have 
मनोज कुमार झा मेंबर ऑफ द राज्यसभा स्पोक्स पर्सन ऑफ द राष्ट्रीय जनता दल बट ही इज मच मोर देन अ पॉलिटिशियन ही इज अ प्रोफेसर ही इज अ प्रोफेसर एट द डेली स्कूल ऑफ सोशल वर्क ही एट द यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ डेली ही हेडेड इट and he is deeply interested in issues relating to not just the political economy of this country and governance but social movements and social action manoj ji aaiye tashreef rakhiye we extremely happy to have with us subhashini ali she is a former member of parliament from kanpur currently a member of the politburo of the communist party of india marxist she has been remains and was a former president of the idwa or the all india democratic women's association and it was ajaz's idea that please ask her he just she made a few comments on the social media and we says okay let's have subhashini ji she is not been particularly well take that hot water with you and last but not the least we're very happy to have with us here senior advocate who practices in the supreme court colin gonzalez most of you know him he specializes in issues relating to protection of human rights uh labor laws public interest laws and some of you may not be aware of where he, where it all began at the indian institute of technology in bombay he was an engineer there a civil engineer there and then became a lawyer won several awards initiated several public interest litigation pet petitions too long for me to read that list so what we are going to do i'm going to move away from here we're going to ask ajaz to speak about his book and not just what motivated him but what is this book all about and then after that in the order that i introduce them we'll ask each of the speakers to speak for about 15 minutes or so and after that the floor will be open please shorter can is more than i'll make it up no problem <laughs> no problem so uh, you can speak as long as you like or as little as you wish to and yeah after that we'll open the floor to questions and anybody can speak uh, anybody can give your comments uh, and your views on the book and if you haven't bought the book please do thank you so much you yeah so focus on the caste dimension of the mapore dam which is largely now cited as an example of of abuse misuse and abuse of the unlawful activities prevention act is also held out as an example of the state prosecuting activists on the charges of of waging war against the state on the basis of evidence which are allegedly manufactured so the himakore gaon story actually begin is a also it begins with caste what happened after the bjp came to power in 2014 at the center and then in maharashtra a few months later a lot of caste russian caste atrocities in maharashtra in 2015 uh uh the uh, uh, rss chief mohan bhagwat he spoke about that why economic criteria should be the basis of reservation and it should not be caste based it spread a lot of anxiety among among the other obc groups we also they also there was also uh, an incidents of lynching in the name of cows occurring very frequently then january 2016 the suicide of robert rabula created a lot of ferment in bombay and people were out on the streets demanding justice in the same year it got some on june 25th if i remember right the amitka bhavan the iconic amitka bhavan was demolished in a midnight operation then we had the urna case where seven dalits were flogged for skinning a dead cow in the same year there was a 15 year old maratha girl who was brutally raped and killed her assailant was a mohammed and it soon became a issue of marathas versus dalits the marathas took out silent marches in towns and cities of maharashtra and by 2017 november there were as many as 50 that were held all over the state 
they they had three demands. They obviously demanded justice for the girl, but they also demanded dilution of the scheduled cars and scheduled tribes, prevention of atrocities, and and they want, demanded also reservation for themselves. And this led to counter mobilization with a lot of OBC groups and Dalit groups <coughs> organizing their own marches in opposition to the Marathi uh, the Marat marches organized by Maratha Maratha Mukranti Mocha. Seeing this, and because it seemed that Maharashtra's Khas Cauldron was simmering, two retired justices, B.P. Savant and uh, 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 B.G. Kolse Patil, they, they, they looked upon it as what they call the emergence or the return of the Peshwas, which in <coughs> complementary of Maharashtra is considered to have been very oppressive, especially oppressive of the lower caste, and established domination and head. Uh, of, of grammatical rule. So they decided that why don't they organize a meeting of civil society groups uh, cutting across all cars and hold a kind of a cultural program. They call it the Elgar Parisha. The Elgar in Marathi means appeal and Bidya Kutsapati told me it was essentially a loud appeal against the casteist and communal policies of the RSS and the BJP. They decided to hold it in Pune, and the date they chose was 31st December 2017. The reason they chose this date was that on 31st, 1st, there were lakhs of Dalits who were supposed to go down to Bhima Koregaon village, which is just about 30 kilometers from the city of Pune, to offer their home to, home to, to celebrate the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Bhima Koregaon. Now, it's well known that, that uh, uh, some 700, 800 soldiers of the British Indian Army <coughs> defeated uh, Bhadi Rao II, essentially triggering a countdown for the dismantling of the Peshwa rule. They, uh, at the same spot, the British they, they, they just undermined the importance of the battle. The British erected a victory pillar over there and etched the names of people, soldiers who died fighting the Peshwa. 22 of those names were of Maharkas, who were then considered untouchables. There, so the, when the meeting, the Elder Parishad was essentially a cultural show. There were a lot of speeches made against the BJP, against the RSS, against their policies. You had a lot of young men as well as old speakers speaking there, but the real draw was a Kabir Kalaman, where, where they used songs and, and uh, play to to launch ideological sallies against Hindutva and against Brahmical Hinduism and the BJP and the RSS. There were apprehensions that there will be there will be a, a kind of protest and there will be some kind of pushback against it. There was an intelligence report which warned that the RSS, the VHP, and the Milinje Kote's outfit, Samasta Hindu Agari, would be opposing it. But really nothing happened there. There was another parallel thing which was again related to caste, and that was happening at Vadu Budru, which is a village three kilometers away from Dima Koregon, where is the where there exists the Victory Park Pillar. At Vadu Budru is located the Samadhi of Chhatrapati Sambhaji, who as as is known was executed by Aurangzeb in 1689. March 11th, yeah, March 11th, 1689, and his body was dismembered and his pieces was captured. Now, there was a long lingering dispute as to who cremated him. Uh, Dalits, Dalits said that they, it was their ancestor, Govind Gopal, who did it, who stitched the body parts and cremated them. On the other hand, the Marathas claimed, claimed that uh, no, it was a Shivli couple, essentially Bapuji, Bhupa, and Padmavati, who did so. This dispute act was of more, uh, roughly about 15 years, 20 years in the making. There were, existed a board inside the some precincts of the Samadhi of Shambhaji, Chhatrapati Shambhaji, which, which, gave how, which gave the credit to the entire village, village residents of Adhupatra of having cremated Shambhaji. There was, however, a line which said that the three servants of the Vritavan of the garden that was built around the Samadhi, there were three servants, and one of them was Govind Gopal, 
and he was a Mahar by caste and this matter is significant. The book didn't spell out what the, why, they con why it was considered significant, but you, just about every story believes it was significant because a Mahar, ma it was significant because the Mahar and untouchable was associated with, with the Samadhi of the Ch uh, Chhatrapati. Nevertheless, this board, this board in 2015 was uprooted and instead there was another board that was installed there. And this board did two things. It first claimed that it were the Marathas who had the, fam the Sibley family which had cremated somebody. And the second point, what they did was to efface any reference, they deleted all reference to Govind Gopal. For that it seemed that their claim to history was being denied. They wrote letters, especially a person called Kiran Sh uh, Shinde of, of Buddhist Prade Nagru, he wrote letters. He had also accused, and that is an accusation which was echoed by others, that Milan Lekwote was the person responsible for it. Milan Lekwote was basically heading or even the guiding spirit of this uh, Dharavir Sambhaji uh, Maharaj Samiti, which used to look after a lot of the Samadhis over there. But nothing really happened, and the Dalits of what the Guru thought, I mean, I mean, to let the matter linger and to wait for the state to intervene, they, at this rate, and the state were not to intervene, the memory of Govind Gopal would gradually get a face from public memory. So, on the night of December 28, 29, they erected their own board. This board was outside the presence of uh, somebody, somebody, and uh, in there they made the claim that it was none other than Govind Gopal Mahar who had cremated somebody. The following morning, the Marathas were outraged, they uprooted, uprooted the board, they desecrated the Samadhi of Govind Gopal, which is also located in the same village. There were people who were arrested under the Atrocities Act. Uh, the Marathas filed cross complaints, but the police were wanted to take as a precautionary measure, what the police did was to bring about the two warring groups to uh, brought about truce between them and uh, and uh, uh, essentially because they felt that if this kept on, if this tension continued, it would mar the celebration of uh, January 1 when lots of Dalits would be present there. Uh, on 30th December, the same million big boats uh, distributed a press note at Sonai Hotel in, in Pima Korega, where, where he kind of disparaged the whole tradition of Dalit celebrating the, uh, the Battle of Pima Korega, saying that it is anti national, that some of these people are being motivated by the Nazarites, and that it is that, that, that uh, Ambedkar. When he visited the Victory Pillar on 1st January 1927, <laughs> he, uh, he said that it was not a matter of pride for the Marathas to have fought, uh, sorry, uh, for the Dalits, Mahars to have fought on the side of the Britain. Uh, despite the truce on the 1st January, uh, there were some like 200, 300, 50 uh, people waving saffron flags, sporting tilaks, uh, shouting slogans in praise of Ekbote, RSS, Sambadi Bide, etc. And then they, and they also sang Pridna Mantra. Now, Pridna Mantra drips with uh, militancy. I mean, I would like to read it, but maybe it would like, take too long. So let me just cut that short. One thing led to the other, and they were soon, I mean, they were also shouted insulting slogans. And this was also countered by the, this was also countered by Dalits, and ultimately it led to stone throwing, that one person was killed, uh, about, you know, 48 people, civilians were hurt, police personnel about roughly about 68 were injured. The matter, the matter would have rested there, but uh, on, on second, second jet, I mean, it was now, Dallas were obviously very outraged that the celebration had been like spoiled. On 2nd January, Anita Salvi, who, uh, who was present, who was one of the participants in the 200th anniversary celebration, she filed a complaint 
accusing a Bote and somebody B day of having fomented the violence. Uh, there was a Maharashtra Bund on, uh, on January 3rd, which was a huge, uh, the response was massive. Some people said that it was the mobilization was unprecedented scale. There was also a crackdown on that. A lot of Dalit young Dalits were put behind bars. But, so there was this, but there was this growing outcry that, that Melinda Kote and somebody they should be arrested. However, then the thought takes a strange twist. Seven days later, that is on 8th January, uh, Tushar Damagode, a 37 year old businessman in Pune, he files a police complaint. He goes to Vishnu. He said he was very much present there at El Gapadesha and he thought that the that the, the slogan, the speeches that were made, and the performances of the Kabir Kalamanch were essentially very provocative and designed to designed to instill a feeling of vengeance among backward classes. And then he went on to claim that this was exactly the policy of the moist, moist, and he therefore also dug out, saying that some of these Kabir Kalamanch activists had been had been apprehended. Arrested for being moist in 2011, which in fact is true, but the case is still pending and all of them were given granted bail. In one of the bail petitions, in fact, Justice Thipsi of the Bombay High Court actually raised concerns about how the police were investigating the case. Nevertheless, uh, uh, it, when this complaint was filed and this now became, became uh, was taken up by the Pune police essentially in Shivali Pawar. And Shivati Pawar in March filed, he filed an application in uh, the court of uh, uh, magistrate, first class magistrate, saying, saying that he wanted uh, a warrant of search to be issued against six people. The six people first named uh, Jyoti Chapter, Pramesh Daichor, Sudhir Dawale, Sagar Gorke, Hachari Pudar, and Deepak Dengli. It should be pointed out that Deepak Dengli was not even even present present on the stage. He was in India, in fact, left the Kabir Kalamans a few months ago. This application, and he also named the name the Vesurinda Gadley and uh, Rona Wilson. He wanted the warrants of search to be issued against them. The magistrate, however, rejected the application. So. Uh, Shivaji Pawar goes back to the court in another two weeks and now this time he files a, files a more detailed application. He adds 350 more words to the previous one but he also does a very strange thing. He knocks out knocks out the six Kabir Kalamanch plus Sudhir Dawale from the list of from the people whom he wanted the arrest warrant, the warrant a search to be issued and he just has Surindra Gadling and Rona Wilson. Now, this may seem very strange, why did he do it? But with hindsight, we know that the computers of these two people were, yeah. were hacked and incriminating documents were uploaded. So in other words, Shivani Pawar knew where the evidence was, with whom it was, and what was the content of the evidence. There, there, I mean, but then no one knew. Then it was Calvin Magazine in 2020, which did two uh, stories, uh, is suggesting and in fact bringing out evidence saying that that uh, Surinder Gatling's computer, as well as Rona Wilson's, had been had been manipulated. Then came uh, Arsenal Consulting Report, and they came up. This was in 2021. They also uh, pointed out, in fact, it was a very detailed report showing how hackers. Hackers had taken control of the computers of Sridhar Gadley, Rula Wilson, and subsequently also he came to know of Father Stan Swami and planted incriminating, incriminating documents on them. But yet the state wasn't willing to do anything. Then there was another thing that came up, which was Sentinel, Sentinel Space. This is another uh, uh, cyber security firm, which is close to the wired magic, saying that. Uh, to the Wired magazine, saying that the three that a uh, security analyst of an email service provider told them that the emails of Varvara Rao, Hani Babu, and uh, Rona Wilson had been hacked. But scandalously, they also pointed out 
that the recovery, the email addresses in the recovery, recovery email addresses and the phone number was of, a, uh, uh, of an investigating officer who was very, who was investigating the case. I mean, they didn't disclose the name. Uh, I mean, this really again raised the question that who's tampering? Was it an operation of the state? Subsequently, they showed that, it, that there were links to Pune police, to the police officer, and subsequently to Al Pashad, they disclosed his name, and it was none other than the chief investigating officer, Shivaji Pawar. Yet the state, and I think, uh, I mean, Colonel uh, Gonzalez would probably say, the, Supreme, the court should have taken note of it. The court should have probably taken the suit, motor cases. So was the police officer acting, what, has he gone rogue or did he have the approval of his state forces? No one seemed to be interested in it. There is obviously a petition, two petitions of, uh, of Schumer Sen and Rona Wilson saying that asking that a, a special investigation team should be investigated, they should be appointed to prove who were the people responsible for, for manipulating and for hacking and for planting incriminating documents. This petition was filed in 2021 and it came up for first hearing in last year in October and we don't know when it will be finally the judgment will come. But, but I mean, so what we took to see the two things, however, however, it was, it also seems the case that whether Elga Parishad would have been held or it would have been held or whether there would have been violence at Bhima Korega or not, some of the some of the accused of Bhima Korega would have been targeted. Why do I say this? Because because Rona Wilson's computer was was taken over, remotely controlled, or was hacked in 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 sometime in June 2016. Surrender Gardens was done in February 2016. And Father Stan Swami's was done all the way back in 2014. It's just that the state decided that maybe the caste pressure, the caste, the caste politics that is going on with this caste, uh, cross caste attempts at cross caste mobilization is probably the appropriate moment to weaponize, weaponize the documents they had planted. And that's how the Bhima Kore comes. This thing in the story of this keeps unfolding. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Uh, I've said to many people I've met since the publication of this book that I officially released it in the Indian Parliament. Uh, <clears throat> to ab koi mukadma wagera hoga nahi. And what I liked very much, I mean, I love the fact that Paranjoy has become a publisher, so his name pro prominently comes here, Paranjoy. And that also tells us about the sad part of it. While working on to spend 10 minutes with you on this book, I was uh, reading one old book, The Destruction of European Jewry by Rol Hilberg. He did not get a publisher when this book was written initially. So times have changed. Things have not changed much. Uh, speaking to Ajaz Saab, I said I'll speak only on the memory aspect of it. Because this book, the opening line says, and I wish to read it. Uh, <laughs> Rahim Asum Raza, ek bar Bombay mein, scene 75, scene 75 unki ek kitab hai. To unho ne usme ek zikri kiya kisi dharmadikari sahab se baat kar rahe the. To dharmadikari sahab ne kaha rahe, ya aapne meri muh ki baat chhin li. Le kamal karte ho, teen din se muh mein leka baitha hua hu ye baat. Anyway, so the opening line is, the story you are about to read does not begin with the beginning. I agree. And I disagree. I agree because transgenerational transfer of memory has multiple layers. 
if we are not able to capture, if we are not able to capture before 2018, it's not the fault of the memory, but the instruments we employ to capture that memory. And from here, I'll just take a few minutes. Vamik D. Vulcan, he works on large group identity. And he uses those two terms very frequently, chosen trauma and chosen glory. <coughs> Any community, particularly the community we refer to as subaltern communities, whose memories have been suppressed, who, have, who are actually made to live with the memory provided by others, it's very difficult for them to contain, retrieve their memory and then go for transgenerational transfer. It's not that easy process. It was difficult in Europe for certain people. It was more difficult for blacks in America. And it is impossibly difficult for the Dalits in India. The kind of prohibition Dalits have to face even today, the do's and the don'ts, the new Peshwai, what is one of the dominant themes in this book, Bhima Koregaon, uh, on Bhima Koregaon. So I would actually want us to look at the fact that memory is the most important subterranean theme in this book. What are we going to do about it? Why it so happens that memory of a community A gets all kinds of privileges. The memory of the privileged. The privileged can rewrite their memory. They can alter which things are not comfortable. But that kind of leg room, that kind of flexibility is not available. That's why I said in India it is much more difficult because knowledge system it is still being controlled by the ones whom I would also call like you new Peshwai. Whether it is universities. I come from a university and I know the reality. I am a member of parliament. I know my parliament. I have worked for a political party. I know the nature of political parties. I watch government. I have been watching governments. I know how governments function. More often than not, new Peshwai is part of their DNA. I mean, I wish things change. They would. Because after 200 years, when this event was called for, nobody had ever imagined. I mean, many of us were educated about Bhima Koregaon. Now, it was not part of our uh, cognitive frame because it was not meant to be. So thank you once again. You have done it. Together with Ajaz's book, I also released another book in parliament, Alpa Shah's Incarceration. But both of the, both the books look at the same phenomena with different angle. That is why I won't call them two books on the same theme, two complementary readings on the same theme. Now, uh, I mean, actually, I thought I'll... Uh, now, I again go back to memory. My interest in memory started with यहाँ इतने विद्वान लोग हैं इतने जिनको मैं फॉलो करता हूँ उनके सामने कुछ बोलने में झिझकता भी हूँ मेरे एक मित्र बैठे हुए हैं पीछे हॉलोकास्ट मेमोरी इट गेव बर्थ टू अ डिसिप्लिन कॉल मेमोरीग्राफी हमारे यहाँ ये नया है बल्कि इस पर काम बहुत हुआ नहीं है आई कोट अगेन द वन आई हैज रेफर that on account, Holocaust did not disturb the humanity only on account of the scale of killings. But, I paraphrase, 
the shock resulting from the fact that this event had not been predicted and that its consequences had inadequately been recognized. That applies. Just forget Holocaust in the background. Bring it to our caste structure. Denial. Discrimination. Not only physical discrimination. Discrimination in memory. Denial of what you can hold on to. The second, the challenge represented by this event to values mm, because they all constantly, in fact, Zygmunt Bauman worked on modernity and the Holocaust and he said how could it be possible, uh, the kind of destruction, because modernity be meant uh, something very great, desirable, and then enlightenment tradition. At least Europe, Germany, had a tradition to question. I'm sorry to say, we never had a tradition. I'm not a great votary or admirer of enlightenment tradition, but there is a conspicuously missing link in the thousand years history of this civilization that we never had something called enlightenment matrix. And that's why it is very difficult for people. I mean, I, I, in fact, uh, Ajaz Sahab quoted that Ambedkar Sahab was not very happy that why did you side with Britishers? But I'm not very happy saying that in a particular context when Ambedkar Sahab said this. No, he didn't. No, no, no. No, no. What I mean that joining the Britishers cannot be a matter of pride. Yeah, that was like... He like it was Dhananjay Kheer saying. Dhananjay Kheer, the biographer. Yes. The biographer. Because I, I, I know, but at the same time, Dhananjay Kheer has also provided so much of minute detail of his yes. life. For instance, one particular incident that uh, class mein the, teacher ne kaha ki aao, tum is sawal ko hal karo. He was good in mathematics. So, jaise hi piche se ho aay, aur... Uh, Board ke piche tiffin boxes rakhe huye te upper caste ke. The, the moment Ambedkar came there, unho ne apne apne tiffin box nikalne shuru kar diye. And then the crackle sound did not leave him even when he was in Colombia. So what I, what I essentially wanted to uh, comment upon the fact that when it's all about your existence, it's a persona, collective persona. You cannot, you should not, you are not supposed to align with what is offered to you as a dominant narrative of the event. If on an evening here I find so many people willing to engage on Bhima Karega, I think this engagement, more than anything else, could be a situation that we are looking at the possibility that no memory has to live with a caste kind of a structure. That this memory is greater because it occupies the upper rung. This memory is irrelevant or doesn't mean much because it occupies the lower rung. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm not feeling at all well, but this is such a great book that uh, when I was asked to come, I had to come. And I think I'm going to speak about very different things from Manoj and Ajaz, maybe that's just as well. Uh, the point I'd like to make is that this book brings out some things which are very, very interesting. Maybe we can say we know it, but do we really know the intensity of it? For me, one thing that this book brought out was the intensity of the hatred that Brahminical Brahmins feel for every other caste, the intensity of that hatred. And it is not only for Muslims or for Dalits, but it's also for the intermediary castes. It's very interesting if you go through this book, a lot of historical things are mentioned. And actually, these two evil men, Milind, what was that? Ekbote. Milind, Ekbote, and that uh, Shambhaji Bhide, they use Shivaji morning, noon, and night as an icon who fights Muslims, hates Muslims. 
wants to destroy Muslims. That is the way in which they use him. And I'll just digress a little bit. I was recently in Kolhapur. You all know that when the Peshwas got rid of Shivaji's uh, descendants, they sent them off to pasture in uh, Kolhapur. And in Kolhapur, there is a fort not far away called Vishalgarh, which is pre-Shivaji, pre-Marathas. And there's a very old mazar there. That's also pre-Shivaji. So recently, this uh, Bhede, he has been uh, organizing meetings around that area in Sangli, Satara, Pune, and telling people that all these forts have to be reclaimed because there are so many, uh, so many people who have gone there and started living there and encroachments. And uh, the, as you know, it's very interesting that now you have a home minister once again. He was the chief minister in 2018, whose name is Fadnavis. And if you all are familiar with Peshwai history, Fadnavis is, you know, too good, uh, <laughs> what should I say? Matlab, bhoat mazedar baat hai ki iska naam Fadnavis hai. Anyway, so they have been appealing to Fadnavis to remove these encroachments. And the government gave some uh, sort of a, uh, they said, yes, we are going to do it. So in uh, the month of, must have been July, I think, uh, a date was uh, decided upon that the encroachments in this Vishalgarh would be removed. And the uh, people, uh, the administration went there and they saw okay, there wasn't much there and the people who were living there were quite agitated, so they didn't do anything. But meanwhile, this Bhide had got a whole lot of people very excited in Pune, Sangli, and even some parts of Kolhapur. So they arrived there in the middle of the night, uh, or early morning of the 16th of July. And when they saw that they couldn't enter the actual fort, Vishalgarh, because of the police presence, and also the people who were Hindus and Muslims had all gathered together and were, you know, refusing to let them enter. So then they retreated a little bit, and there is a little basti of 40 Muslim, 41 Muslim houses there. Just a small basti with a mosque. So they surrounded that and they completely demolished it. They demolished the mosque, they demolished the basti, they demolished everything in the homes, they demolished even the small little uh, cycles that children use. I mean, this was just like such an expression of destruction of something that they hate. And this happened and uh, then, you know, after, and all the women had to run into the jungle. Very few young men lived there because they all go out to work. So the women with their children and some old men, they went into the forest and, uh, you know, then after five or six hours, the police that was there got more reinforcements and these people were then forced to leave the place. So I had gone there and uh, it was very interesting because what has happened as a result is, the, there's a curfew in that area. So nobody can come to that fort and nobody can leave the fort. And all the work of the people in that area is connected with that fort. So there's a Dalit Basti of 100 homes where people have not eaten for about 10, 15 days because of this attack. But I, I'm just trying to tell you that this is now something that is being repeated. So when we see the story of Bhima Koregaon, and what these men have been doing there against the Dalit community, we have to understand that this kind of hatred that they're perpetrating goes much beyond the Dalit community. It's against everybody that's not them. They don't even like Shivaji very much. They only like him as it's... Uh, 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 they only like him as long as they're able to use him as somebody who fights Muslims, kills Muslims, etc., etc. But the moment uh, that, uh, you know, other aspects of his life are revealed, then they don't like him. And there's a very interesting thing in this book about that book by Lane. You know, there was this hysteria, historian called Lane who has written a biography of Shivaji in which he repeats a very crude, but I find it very interesting. It's a very crude sort of a joke, but it's a joke made by Brahmins to sort of claim that even the paternity of Shivaji was actually Brahmin. Brahmin. Because obviously he couldn't have been a great man 
If he was just the son of any old Maratha, he had to be the son of a Brahmin to have achieved that kind of greatness. Kyo jha saab, thik bol raha hai. So, अभी एक बस एक छोटा डायग्रेशन मैं छोटा एक डायग्रेशन कर रहा हूँ इतनी महत्वपूर्ण चीज बात नहीं जो कही और पीएम शायद समझते हैं इसलिए वो देखे होंगे नए वाले पार्लियामेंट में लेकिन वो शंकराचार्य लोगों को अच्छा बिल्कुल नहीं लगा क्योंकि वो भी वो नहीं थे दस्त सिंह वो भी वो नहीं थे वो होते तो जेल जाते एनी वे सो आई फाउंड दिस वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग दिस डीप सीटेड हेट्रेड ऑफ दिस कम्युनिटी और द लीडर्स ऑफ दिस कम्युनिटी स्पोक्स पर्सन फॉर दिस कम्युनिटी फॉर एवरीबॉडी एल्स and i see this as something very negative but i also see this as something very positive that if all the different sections who are actually the recipients of this hatred could understand why they are hated in this way and by whom maybe some more interconnections between people could be made like the people near that fort who have had their houses demolished the dalit community next to them that is starving to death because of what happened to them and i asked everybody कि यहाँ इस फोर्ट में शिवाजी महाराज आए थे उन्होंने कहा हाँ वो भी आए थे बिकॉज ही ही एक्चुअली कॉन्कर्ड दिस फोर्ट फ्रॉम समबडी एल्स तो हमने कहा तो मज़ार को नहीं तोड़ा उन्होंने कह ले नहीं नहीं उन्होंने तो मज़ार पे जाके चादर चढ़ाई सो आई मीन आई डोंट वांट टू गेट इनटू दैट यू नो दिलीप कुमार ने लता मंगेशकर से राखी बंधवाई काइंड ऑफ सेक्युलरिज्म बट द फैक्ट इज दैट द पीपल हु आर बींग यूज एज सिम्बल्स टू प्रमोट हेट्रेड एक्चुअली were not part of that kind of thinking at all so that's one thing that i want to talk about the second thing is that this book i mean it's a book when i read it i feel ashamed of myself i feel ashamed of the fact that one can't do what one should be doing against the atrocities that are described and also i feel small and ashamed seeing the bravery and courage of the people who have been attacked and sent to jail for absolutely no Uh, no reason at all and this is the second point i'm coming to the real mystery of this bhima koregaon is chaliye we know the story of bhima koregaon uh it was a fight against peshwai so obviously the brahmins were not happy that the mahars are celebrating it and celebrating it as a great victory of their manhood against the peshwai that's all there in the beginning is very easy to understand they attacked those people that's also easy to understand they distributed leaflets that this yelgar parisha parisha should not be allowed one can understand all those things but what is very difficult to understand is that why was this whole case instituted first of all the people who are accused are not the people who organized the yelgar parishad some of them ha huh? some of them well the main organizers were two retired judges they were not they were never named and they are going they have repeatedly said we are the organizers we are responsible for what happened but they were never named and then i think that even prakash ambedkar had something to do with the organizing of it he was never named and someone like anand teltumde who is not even a great admirer of what happened in bhima koregaon in 1818 and elgar parishad itself he certainly wasn't there he is named and he is arrested so i think one very big question is why was this whole case framed against these particular people and i think because that's something that's been i mean all of us have been thinking about it they had nothing to do with it why why go to such lengths to implicate these people in the framework of bhima koregaon about which most i think many of them those 16 people had not been there yeah yeah most of them most of them were not there and the names were added later and like gautam's name was added later anand's name was uh, you know all of them were not Some there of them were offered deals to like huh? like yeah 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 they were offered deals and we are we are very proud of their courage that they didn't succumb to all that that's why i said one is really really Uh, really impressed with the courage of these people there are many of them were old one of them died like stan swami many of them you know sai baba the condition he was in the old and sick people i mean horribly 
they were treated, but they did not succumb to pressure and they stood firm. It's quite incredible in that way. It's a very, very inspiring document, this book. But then when you think about why were they implicated and who implicated them, they were not implicated by Ek Bote or uh, Bede or even by, okay, Narendra Modi was there in Delhi and Fadnavas was there, but who actually went to every length possible to implicate them. It was the Maharashtra police, the administration and the police. And therefore, I feel that many of us think, you know, oh, well, in 24, we nearly got rid of them. Bas agli bar to, you know, we are going to do it. But even if we get rid of them, I want to say that the problem is not going to go away. The problem is much deeper. Whether you call it Manuvad or whether you call it the peculiar system of oppression and exploitation that exists in our country, I think calling it Manuvad is a good thing because it covers many aspects. It covers gender, it covers caste, and it also covers class because Manuvad is very clear about class also. Anybody who works is a Shudra. Even if he is born in a Brahmin home or a Kshatriya home, if he works, if he tills a field or if he works in any way, he is a Shudra, he is not then entitled to claim upper caste status. That is my reading. Mukul Thikaram, Manu Smriti mein hai ye. Anyway, so I think Manuvad in our country, it's a good way of expressing the peculiar system of exploitation that exists. And therefore, unless you go into why was the Maharashtra police so intent on punishing these people, why did they go? They hacked their computers. They did everything possible to see that they would be whatever, hanged or certainly put away forever. Why? So certainly, and I think that once again, this is very important because today's discourse is now trying to evade this issue completely as if it doesn't exist. And that is the issue of class. So I think that the issue of class is very much present here because without this whole attitude of protecting, because Anand Telturde says, the Maoists are not a real threat to the Indian state. I mean, they are small organization. They have been annihilated. But obviously, it is a fear of talk of revolution, talk of changing and overturning the social order. Even the talk of that, infuriates and inspires fear in the ruling classes. So I think that that aspect also has to be kept in mind when we're talking about what is going on without understanding that there's no real explanation as to why the administration of Maharashtra, the police of Maharashtra would go to that length and why in between there were two or three years of another government. This happened in 2018, but as I recall, 2020 to 22 possibly, there was another government. Is that right? Those years anyway. And of course, we are being told that just on the day that Mr. Sharad Pawar was planning to raise this issue and do something about it, the next day his um, government was toppled. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, but he should have thought of it maybe two and a half years earlier, you know. My point is that the issue of class and the issue of class character of the state is also something that has to be kept in mind when we are reading something as, um, I don't know what to call it even. I was completely bowled over by this book. I read, was able to read it at a stretch, which was unusual. And as I told you, it made me feel very small, made me feel very ashamed of myself but also inspired me with the stories of these people's indomitable courage and the courage and passion of the writer who has gone into such detail to bring the whole story alive to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ajaz, for this uh, quite terrific book. I thought I had a, a pretty good picture of that period. But uh, reading the book, it uh, 
really taught me a lesson I knew so little as compared to what is actually the story. And the Jazz has covered it in a very comprehensive way. I was thinking if I had brought this book here today, I had millions of flags all around it and highlighting and so on. Um, I want to deal with it in a slightly different way. I want to talk about the names of the people who figure there. All those who suffered so terribly in jail during that period. And I want to concentrate on how we were betrayed by our judiciary in the worst possible ways that's in the sentence. The judiciary betrayed us in the emergency, we knew that. How supine they became in front of a powerful executive. But the story of Bhima Koregao is actually the story of the second biggest betrayal by the judiciary, this time of our modern day freedom fighters, the best in the country. We know the story of Sudan. She was a little lucky to get out with the default bail, which is 180 days pass and you don't find the charge sheet. So without looking into the merits of the case, you can't bail. On the basis of a letter, not written by her, not found on her computer, not signed by her, some third party turns up with that letter, produces it, and that letter, which any judge in India would tell you is not admissible in evidence, on the basis of that letter, <coughs> she went to jail. And she would have suffered a long, long time. She would have been years in jail, were it not for the fact that the police didn't file the charge sheet on the 180th day, six months. They filed it a few days later and missed the mark, and she, she got paid and came out. Sai Baba was not so fortunate. Sai Baba got the brunt of the judiciary's, the brunt of the, how do I speak frankly about things like this? He got the brunt of the casualness and the oof of the judiciary. Two brilliant judges of the High Court granted him bail on merits of the case. I remember his wife saying at a meeting in JNU rather recently, before he was released, she described how when he was a young man, active in politics even then, he would tie a chapel to his hands and a chapel to his knees and crawl on the ground and come up to the stadium where he's going to speak and then speak. Powerful voice, resolute voice. Two judges stood up against the trend which was even then prevailing of being supine to the executive, doing what the executive wanted them to do. <coughs> stood up to them and granted him bail. Brilliant judgment. What happens is our Chief Justice calls a hearing on a Saturday. So he must have been to be released on Friday or Saturday. Orders came not to release him. He was at the gate of the jail in Nagpur to walk out. Some orders were given not to release him and to make those orders permanent. A bench was constituted on a Saturday. Sent him back on the spot. Now you never take a man who's acquitted and send him back unless the acquittal order is reversed. So you'll have a judgment after many, many years, you'll give notice to him, he'll reply. And after many years of hearing, if the court comes to the conclusion that you deserve to go back, you'll get a conviction order. And then he goes back in. It has never happened that after an acquittal order on the basis of, what's the court's observation? The court's observation is we need to think about it. We need to think about it. We need to hear the party. Think about it as much as you want. But the man goes home to his wife and to his family. Immediately, they kept him in jail. The viciousness of that, you know, was terrible in Sai Baba's case. He went back 
But I must say to the credit of the judges in the Bombay High Court, in the second round they stood up for him as brilliantly and as forcefully as they did in the first round. Brilliant judgment, second brilliant judgment in Sai Bhattar's case. I saw him in jail in Nagpur once or twice. You know, we can't really describe, we can't even describe, I don't think anyone can possibly describe the suffering that you go through and the pain. And worst of all, the isolation in jail. You know you've done nothing. The judgment makes it very clear there is no material, there is no material to support the accusation that he engaged in a terrorist act. And that comes through in all the judgments of the persons I will name now. After six years, five years, you come to the conclusion that there is no material to support the accusation of a terrorist act. What is a terrorist act? The intention put into practice of an attempt to overawe the state by use of force. So where was the terrorism in Sai Baba's case? There's not even a murmur of that in his charge sheet. That he attempted by use of force to overthrow the state established by law. So now he's out and he's back with his family. But Sai Baba's case is a case of tyranny. I know Mr. Modi talks about the emergency. But I think this kind of tyranny that puts the emergency to shame, really, the way in which this happened and the way in which our freedom fighters were put. Look at Khalid's case where the High Court says, I deny bail. <laughs> Why? Because Khalid made provocative speeches. Recording in progress. Provocative speeches. In a country like India, where you have 50 judgments of the Supreme Court on freedom of speech and expression, and it's very clear, the Supreme Court has been very clear, you can say anything you want. You can say anything you want, short of hate speech and incitement to overthrow the state. And even incitement to overthrow the state, if I say we should get an army together and overthrow the state, that's not incitement unless it is followed up by armed struggle against the state. Can I say Khalistan Zindabad? Yes, I can. It's part of freedom of speech and expression. It's not sedition. Can I say Azadi? Yes, I can. What was it that Khalid said that made him rot in jail like this? He made some pretty innocuous statements about freedom and Azadi and things like that. So the judge didn't even put the words in his judgment. He just said, I'm putting him in because he used provocative words. And he kept Khalid in. Oh man, look at how he suffered in jail. The Pinjab Thor group in Delhi, young women, young women, doing what? Speaking up energetically against the government. All the crime, all our freedom fighters was only this, that they had the courage to tell the court, to tell the government, we are going to work to catch you by your collar and throw you out the power. Are we within our rights to say that? Of course we can. Can we use very strong language in opposing the central? Of course we can. Now look at the Pinjar Court group. We fortunately got a bench of the High Court. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. They told the public prosecutor, Sir, we don't want to know what the story of the accused is. We don't want to hear about the defense of the accused at all. You tell us on the basis of your charge sheet, assuming your charge sheet to be a correct statement of facts, you tell us where is the act of terrorism. That's it. We don't want to hear the defense at all. And the prosecutor tried, and the prosecutor tried, and the prosecutor tried, and the case was dismissed. Yes, Tola. Gogolian Assam saying, you tell us your story, you prove your story on the basis of your charge in the prosecution case. Gatling. You know, Ajaz, Gatling's story was very actually for me. I knew much later when he had become an accomplished lawyer, I went to his home in Nakhur. 
and he was a very good lawyer doing work for peasants and farmers and so on and, uh, and drivers. Mm. You know, free of cost, free of cost, handling all this free of cost, like Sudha, free of cost, all the time. So, I didn't realize what you describe in your book as the grinding poverty that he went through. Like that gripped my heart, you know, because it was a side of gardening that I did not know. The grinding poverty of him and of his father before him. And how he struggled to become one of the country's best lawyers, criminal lawyers. Jin Jin, I'm still in Jin. Again, they'll not be able to prove anything against that. He will come out maybe six months. The move in the Supreme Court is changing. It, it's, it's changing. You know, thank God for that, actually. Thank God, because we had a very retrograde kind of uh, Supreme Court for a long time. The mood is now changing. I think some of the judges realize, and we really get in the papers, you know, that we've done injustice to a large number of India's leading lawyers and activists and so on. And then, of course, you heard about the putting of the, uh, you know, the mal malware on the computers of our friends. And the question I asked, this is what Ajaz and I discussed. When a judge hears in a report given by an expert that there was somebody together with the police who put malware on the computer, it is interference with the administration of justice. It is contempt of court. What the judge, if he really had the courage, all he had to do is register an FIR against them on the basis of this report of, uh, what was that, uh, Arsenal Consulting. On the basis of this report, I direct the police to register an FIR against the police officers and the investigating officers, and I direct that they be arrested and taken to trial. But our judges didn't have the guts. They just didn't have the guts. And we lawyers don't have the courage also to speak up against judges. But the time has come really to write a history of that period of the blot on democracy by the judiciary. Who were the judges who kept these persons in jail? They will be anonymous in all writings. They remain anonymous. Their names are never spoken of. So, as, so if you see what runs through all these names, and I'll finish very quickly. Not one of them engaged in the crime of terrorism. Six years later, now all the judgments reported in the papers recently, all the judgments say we cannot find material to support the allegation of terrorism. Question is, when he came before you and arrested and he was brought before you in 24 hours as the law demands, in 24 hours when he came before you, why did you look at the papers to see if there was any allegation of terrorism? Why you're supposed to, the law says the remand judge must look carefully to see if the charge against the accused is made up. Is there material to send him back to jail? There was no material day one. And that you said after five years. What an abdication of what a judge ought to do. And lastly, I just want to say, I'm sorry, I'm going past my time. I came back from Chhattisgarh day before yesterday, where we recorded the testimonies of the women. Seventy families whose members had been killed by the police, the Chhattisgarh BRF and the police force and so on. And I thought to myself, and this is something I, I thought to myself, really, it was the same day as Amit Shah came there. And Amit Shah had given a statement saying that in 2027, you must have read about it in the paper. 26. 26. We're going to wipe out all the Nazarites. Yeah. And all those hundred families were categorized as, as, as Nazarites. And they killed men, women, and children. Many children were shot dead in Jatiska. So we recorded that testimony. And in the press conference which we had in the Chattis Cup in the year, um, where was I? Um, forget the name of it. Ajatalpur. In the Jatalpur press club, 
we said to Amit Shah, Amit Shah Ji, I had to be very polite. I know what he can do to me as well. <laughs> yeah, and we said, Amit Shah Ji, if you can show, we're giving you 50 testimonies recorded. 60 testimonies. Tell us one person who came from an Nagsalite family. Tell us one person. And so when you say you will eradicate Nagsalism in a year or two, do you mean to say you will eradicate the Adivasis who are innocent and without arms and so is that what you mean? Why doesn't your police force have the guts to go after the real Nazis instead of going after us? So we had a quite a interesting time there. But what I realized, and I want to conclude by saying this, the real terrorists are not in social, not, are not in civil society. They're not in the NGOs. They're not in the struggle movement. They're not even in the tribal movement. The real terrorists are government. The real terrorists are the state. The greatest terror is state terrorism. And I feel a sense of rage when I see people who are, and we know this because we can see it. We work with people who tell you of the terrorism of the state. With what audacity they you know, hold meetings and you know, say things about how we eradicate terrorism in our country. They are truly the biggest terrorists. And of course, if I can also end by saying this, we must look very closely as journalists, all of you, must look very closely at the performance of the judiciary in this period. You are too afraid of this subsidized kind of uh, prohibition. But I must tell you, subsidized doesn't mean you cannot write. Subsidize only means that you cannot write in a manner to interfere with the administration of justice. In fact, it is precisely where the matter is subsidized that you must do the most insistent writing on the subject. That's the time when you must write. Influencing the court by rational thinking is not interference with the administration of justice. And the judiciary needs very careful, I hope, maybe you or somebody else will write a book of what the judiciary did in the period after Modi came to power. That's the real story. Thank you. Hello. Yes, thank you so much, Colin Gonzalez. Thank you, Subhash Ali. Thank you, Manoj Kumar Jha. Ajaz. Okay. Uh, we are going to open this, the floor out to questions. Manoja has to go soon. He has a personal commitment, a medical commitment. He has to take his mother to the doctor. So I would request uh, if there are any questions specifically for Manoja, please ask these questions to him now. And please identify yourself. Just uh, tell us about... Uh, two lines about you, your, yourself, your name, and please go ahead and ask any question you like. You can ask questions to all the panelists and the author, but uh, Manojji had told me that he has to leave a little early. So if there are any specific questions for Manoj, uh, please go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, speak into one of the microphones. Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm Dr. Nidhi Prem. I'm a political sociologist. Um, actually, uh, couple of things as you were speaking about uh, memory. <clears throat> so the Raoul Hilbert book you mentioned, of course. So we know that in Europe today, um, it's not just European Jewry historically, but also the Romani people, uh, which were also, and they're, in my opinion, they're more subaltern, <laughs> if we can say that. There should never be a quote, Olympics of misery, but um, they're far more subaltern than, than European Jewry. But that said, I wanted to bring up the topic of, of memory, of trauma, and, and what do you see today with, with Gaza? As a counterpoint, perhaps, or as a... No, no, uh, thank you very much. I am on the same page with you. It's just that I took a framework from Elba to drive home a point in case of Dalits in India. On Gaza, uh, I could uh, speak on many things, but I tell you fundamentally, I'm worried about the memory lapse on the part of my state about Gaza, about Palestine. 
Um, I almost every year I used to write pieces about Palestine. I'm part of some groups. Now newspapers don't carry my piece on Palestine. So what I believe that Gaza in a, in many ways it's all about what is done to uh, erase the memory of the people not only living in Gaza, around Gaza, but also historically <coughs> those people who were from India, but part of the Palestinian struggle. Uh, and that's that's what I believe that memory, memory management, memory control is not that kind of um, easy to do kind of exercise. There are bigger players involved in what we should remember, how much of that should we remember and I think my worry, uh, my concern again as a citizen of this country that what Gandhi spoke about Palestine, I cannot repeat that today in my own parliament and if I speak about Palestine or Jai Palestine, long live Palestine, I am an internationalist. But people are taking those risks. Maybe those people who are taking those risks today, tomorrow a book is written like Bhima Korega memory. Thank you. Are there any questions for... Uh, uh, maybe both of you ask a question because he has to leave soon. Yes, please. Okay, uh, that's Feroz. Yeah. Telegraph, yeah. Uh, just, just briefly, in the Bhima Korega case, when Stan Swami and the other woman was in jail, if you are to recall, the BJP was not in power in Maharashtra at the time. The <laughs> entrainment of people in jail happened when a non BJP party were in power. Also, in the 2020 Delhi riots case, you have had a young man from your party, from other <laughs> parties who were in jail, and there seems to be a kind of nervousness among non BJP parties to speak out openly for, for, for them. How, um, how do you explain this? What is the reason? Okay. Uh, 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 Please. 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 To be poor and incarcerated is to be as good as forgotten. Very harrowing words. As good as Being forgotten. forgotten. To be poor and incarcerated, you are left forgotten. So the question is two parts. How do we reclaim the democratic space? You are a member of parliament. And secondly, life in prison reflects these uh, unjust inequalities of our society. What do we do to address this? Fellows, to your question first. If I have tried to make a sense and there is a connection between your question and Gaza and Firoz's question. Uh, I told you, I, I mean, in fact my small ob observation with you, I said I am a part of a political party, I know it. I am part of a parliament, I know the reality. I have watched governments. So, I am not holding any brief but I can tell you that this is beyond political parties, this is institutional rot, institutional bias. So new Peshwai is not only among in the BJP. There are political parties which are comfortable with the grammar of new Peshwai. They will not challenge, they will do cosmetic things. Hold constitution in hand, revive the constitution, <laughs> but no, I, I didn't mean to target any party or individual. What I mean that holding constitution means living it. Then you don't look at the if, but, however. I was I was probably one of the few when the COVID started. The government in Delhi was the first one to have a data public. That was the beginning. That was the beginning. That even in an epidemic, we, we found a, an accused or a culprit or whatever with the bloody distinction, the Muslims have done it. You know, electoral arithmetic makes you win an election. But 
the challenges you are facing, please don't look at election victories as a kind of solution. ये होगा नहीं। चुनाव तो आप जीतते हैं क्योंकि देर और देर मिलके तीन होता है। पांच का पूरा खेल है, दो उधर रह गया तीन आपके साथ। And similarly with Maharashtra, I mean there are many things which makes you very uncomfortable. She was very right. She had pointed it out. इस पूरे दौर में दो सवा दो साल, Father Stan Swami और Sai Baba, I mean if if they are fake the way Colin said, if it doesn't make you anxious, you are politically dead, you might be winning election. You might form a government. But not on the same basis, not on the kind of same pitch whom you are fighting against. So again I use the new Peshwai metaphor. To your question, what can I say? Uh, retrieval of democratic space can never be the sole work of parliamentarians. Never. I'm sorry to use, I'm going to draw a kind of parallel. I believe what has happened in Bangladesh, if you don't look at it through the lens of Indian government, or dominant Indian state media, you would consider that's a journey. People reclaim the democratic space. It is the people, not the parliamentarians. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manojji, for coming here. And uh, uh, I hope uh, everything's fine on the, on the family front. And Thank you once again. Uh, but we, st we still have a little bit of time. We still have about 10, 10 12 minutes. Uh, if there are any questions you'd like to ask any of you to the other panelists, to Subhash Ali, to Colin Gonzalez, and of course to Ajaz himself. Ask them difficult questions, you know. Shall I ask you a question? You know, uh, are you seeing the Marxists today somewhat reluctantly or belatedly realizing the importance of caste. And, and, and do you believe that the Marxists, one of the reasons why they, the, the power or, or their representation, not just in parliament, but otherwise appears to have shrunk because of their inability uh, to accept the importance of caste in Indian society? This is my question to you. That's quite a, means a lengthy reply, but I will just say that I don't think that the Marxists or the communists have ever uh, negated the importance of caste. In fact, if we go back to 1930, the first uh, uh, you know, program of the Communist Party was published in 1930 and it talked about the words I use, annihilation of caste. That is even before Dr. Ambedkar used that term. But certainly I feel that fighting caste oppression in many states over the years, in some states, like in Uttar Pradesh earlier, it was a very, uh, very big priority. And I think that the left gained a lot at that time. And there were things that happened. But I feel that while it is wrong to say that the left or the communists negated the importance of caste, one can certainly say that yes, they did not fight against caste oppression in the same way in many parts of India as they did against class oppression. But okay. having said that, I would also say don't go by electoral gains because the people who are using caste mobilization for electoral gains, they are also casteist and therefore they are also oppressive in different states in different ways. And that is not something that should be a paper over. So I think that sometimes we get very excited, like you got very excited by what happened in Uttar Pradesh in the last election. I was very excited also. All of us are. Huh? All of us are. All of us are very yeah, excited. I, I mean, the fact is the Bharatiya oh, Janta Party's Lok Sabha yeah, numbers oh, have shrunk. That's very true. But the point is that caste politics and caste arithmetic, they are games that many can play. And so therefore that euphoria 
I hope it isn't to be short lived also because Bharati Janta Party is also extremely intelligent in using caste divisions. And this recent judgment of the Supreme Court, which many of us here support also, but could all, they are very clever at using it on both sides, supporting it and opposing it. So these are difficulties. And now, if you see what uh, Mayawati ji is doing, she is contesting three by elections and opposing the Supreme Court judgment. This could have its own electoral uh, results, which would not be to our liking. And you've also seen, you mentioned Prakash Ambedkar. You've seen what happened in Maharashtra. No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what about you did in Maharashtra. All right. No problem. But I'm just saying that caste politics and mobilization of castes uh, for political gains, I don't think that that really is the way forward to social justice. All right. Yes. Uh, are there any other questions from anybody in the audience? No, once a police officer does something wrong, you said the judge tells him to prosecute him. If the judge has committed a blunder, <laughs> what is the way out? Can they be prosecuted? No way out. <laughs> <laughs> At all. I mean, just in India, see, the judges have done so much damage to our imagination, to everything. <laughs> well, I suggested actually the first step. You must start monitoring what judges do. You must write about what judges do. You must identify those who are responsible for keeping our freedom fighters in jail. We don't do that. Don't look beyond that. Just do this. In fact, if you monitor what judges do and you hold them accountable for their judgments, that will go a long way. Judges know they are not accountable. Judges know when people talk about a judgment, they talk about the Supreme Court, but who in the Supreme Court wrote that judgment? Who denied bail to our people? That's the important thing, right about it. So that's important. That first step is important. Monitor the judiciary. The fact that we it. Follow up question. Please. Follow up question from Faraz. Will reservation in judiciary, right up to the top, will it help? Maybe. May help. May help because it's an utterly upper class elitist, upper class, upper class elitist institution. You might find brilliant people from the reserve category. In reservation, reservation for women, particularly. We are at 20% uh, women in our judiciary. Can you imagine? And at the, as you go higher, it comes it's very bad. Yeah. Okay, Javid, I uh, yeah. A legal question, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, for Colin, in Bhima Koregao case and other cases, how come in this country, uh, people deliberately telling lies, <laughs> police officers and so on, are never prosecuted and convicted for perjury? See, that tradition is now... Never, a, never for perjury. That tradition of allowing crimes to be taken, the crimes to be done by policemen is roughly 10 years. Before that it existed, but it accelerated over the last decade. And after Modi came to power, it's accelerated enormously. So today, every policeman knows. No judge in this country will take a policeman to task. You can see the injustice going on in front. You can see the prosecution case is a false case. You can see them lying to the court. In fact, your ultimate judgment after six years of incarceration will say exactly that. Sai Baba's case, everybody's case. That there was no material. So what does that mean? The police lied. And the police deliberately kept you in jail. Now, which judge has the, the confidence or the guts to stand up and say, I'm going to prosecute the police? Police know that they have the judiciary completely on their side. Judiciary is not going to take them to task. So now you'll have police raj of the kind we've never seen before. Theoretically, what is the maximum sentence for perjury? I don't remember, but quite a bit. Virgin in court particularly, mm. plus interference with the evidence. You get some time. But who does perjury for a policeman? Nobody. Nobody has the guts. 
It's a question of guts, really. It might come back if you have, as they said. If you have, as they said, you know, if you get a Dhaka in Delhi, She's asking for you might, you know, see a change. Go ahead, ask your question. No. Press the button. I'm a judge's friend. So, <laughs> I so basically, I, I read half the book, so maybe the answer is in the book. I'm not sure. But I do want to folk ask about this Maharashtra police angle, which uh, uh, one or two of you have raised over here. What would be their specific interest in manufacturing a case? Would it not be the case that the RSS or the political executive had asked them to do it? Why would they be an independent? No, not necessarily. I didn't understand. Sure. Not necessarily. So, so Ajay, yeah, partly some of it can be answered. We don't know. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Partly it can be answered. So, for instance, take Suranda Gamble. For over nearly 20 years, the police had been threatening him. Because each time there were all these false cases that they instituted against Radhi Mercies and he got them free. So, it became like a challenge to them. And in fact, few months before he was actually arrested, or few months before he was uh, raided on seven, uh, this thing, they told him that, uh, uh, that they told his wife, Meena, that next <coughs> So that, that particular is one angle. This is second. Yeah. Aap bully. Then aap bully. Yeah, I mean, that is another angle. And secondly, we can't forget that they were acting, they are part of the state. Mm -hmm. They do take orders from somewhere. Because we do not have anything to say, but the fact is, Shoma Sen again, she, she used to create problems for them because she would go on fact-finding missions, and so they would feel very threatened that there would be cases, cases of atrocities committed or that she would break up. So in that sense, they were they were opposed to them. And then there must be some lot of other factors working, which we can only make a guess but can't speak about. See, one thing that we forget is that if you see police behavior, I would say practically from independence onwards. And that's why I keep saying this after Modi, after Modi, to some extent, yes, but there was a before Modi also. If you see police behavior in communal riots, I have not seen any policeman being prosecuted for what they do, acts of commission and omission during communal riots. What is the kind of investigation do, that they do? Whom do they hold responsible? In riot after riot after riot, it's exactly the same story. The people who've suffered the most in loss of life, loss of property, are also the ones who are the greatest number of people arrested and also maybe the greatest number of people shot by the police. So you have a case where the police actually shot Muslims who I was lined them up near a, a, a canal and shot them to fall inside. And the FIR was lodged by none other than an IPS officer and still nothing happened. So we are waking up now to many things that have actually been, I don't say that something, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to knock it. But it's a fact that we are waking up now to what the police and the administration and the state have been doing right from independence. They're not doing anything different. This is the way they operate against Muslims, against poor people, against Dalits, against women. You try being a woman who goes to a police station and says, my husband's beating you up. And the answer you'll get is, if it's not your husband beating you up, who do you think, who do you want to beat you up? I mean, that's, that's a pretty natural answer you'll get there. So what I'm saying is, the kinds of... Uh, Prejudices that are there are certainly there in the cops also. And then, as Ajay said, and as we should never forget, they are part of the state. They are the most, they are the part of the state that impacts directly with human beings, with the citizens. So all the things that are wrong with the state, you are going to see in their behavior. And we should never disassociate them from the class character of the state. And I would just add one more yeah. thing that some of the accused in Pima Kolejong were non Gonzalez, Arun Ferrer, uh, Ramesh Gaichur, Sagar Gorke, uh, uh, Subir Gawale. All these people were incarcerated 
under the Congress regime. Yeah. They were in prison for many years. Before. Some of them were in wife of, His wife was also there he, and then he, she was re he, released he, afterwards. In Daichur and Sadabuki, the case is still going on. And the case was filed in 2011 and it's now 2024. The same case is then cited in, in this other one, yeah. instances, saying that, like, look, they have a moist pass because they were implicated in a particular case, which had this moist angle. On the other hand, Varnam Gerda, where's Arun Ferreira? Arun Ferreira was tortured, tortured massively. These are all things happen under the Congress regime. We should never forget that. And this is a lot to do with the structure of the state that we have. And what uh, uh, Colin Gonzalez was talking about, depositions in uh, Jagalpur that he was witness to, that too is a. I mean, we had had Operation Rina, you know, like this Salva Jadu, etc. Sri Krishna Commission. Yeah. So we had like this. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. Anything else you'd like to say by the concluding remarks? One last thing I want to say. That's also very interesting in his book, and then I'm going to end. Uh, another very interesting thing that brings up, that's brought out is, because somebody asked me specifically about Maharashtra, and I said I know more, but it's interesting that this is set in Maharashtra. And uh, two things are very interesting. Two or three people who were first devotees of uh, that Bhile, they then sort of see through him, and they are now working for communal harmony, all that's very nice. But what's very interesting is, when I told you this hatred of this Brahminical mind for anything that is not Brahmin, they hate the name of Phule, they hate the name of Ambedkar, they hate the name of Savitri Bhai. So I'm, I'm trying to say that it is also possible if what is in this book, unfortunately many of us read it and then forget about it, oh how terrible and you know that's it. But what is in the book, if we really try to explain to people at large, I think that there is an awakening. People are coming to understand that many people across sections of society have the same problems and face the same kind of, uh, the same kind of violation of their rights, but that needs to be known much more. The fact that they dislike Shivaji no. and... The, the funny thing about those people who left somebody, they, they said that somebody is, has made Shivaji very popular. That was but the original reason why they joined. That, but when James Lean book comes, that's right. somebody made it and speak so about So that's interesting. What I'm saying is that there are ways of, you know, we think that their propaganda just cannot be met. There's no way of, you know, cutting, but that's not true. The in, uh, The... Examples of these people is very interesting, and what were the reasons? Yeah. Anyway. Colin, you like to say something? Ajaz? No, thank you. Okay. You forgot I to tell people that Colin was an activist before all of this also. Yeah, I thought he was an engineer. No, no, no. Before an engineer, he was an activist all right. when I knew him way back in Bombay. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think all of you. Uh, we started with over 75 people in this place. A lot of people were standing. This place has capacity Wasn't that for nice of you? just about 65 people, 55 seats. I'm happy that more than 50 of you are still around. And I just wanted to make two points. If I'm out here, you know, this is being recorded. Yes, of course, this is being recorded. <coughs> Somebody, uh, if there are anybody from the Intelligence Bureau, we'll be happy to inform you that every single word has been recorded, thanks to Chandan Singh and OP. And we will be putting it up on YouTube very soon in the next few days, I hope. Oh, heavens. And we'll all go to jail after that. And yes. then all of you can uh, pass it on to our yeah. friends. And last point that I'm going to make is we are having this book at present translated to Marathi. And we are hopeful that this will come out in the near future. Ideally, we'd like this book to come out in as many languages as possible, but yes, there are. Good, good. Thank you once again.